In various interviews of yours that I've seen in the past, you've mentioned your father's battle with heart disease to be very much of a push factor for you to enter cardiology. So I was also wondering if besides this, if you had a specific experience or a moment where you decided you wanted to spend the rest of your life doing just science in general, besides cardiology. You know, because of the fact that I like being with people and when my father had heart disease, I, you know, learned about it firsthand about the changes my family had to make to improve the way they ate and that my father, um, we really tried very much to encourage him to exercise. And I would say um, he, he, he really never mastered that. I remember him getting a stationary bicycle and it was in my parents' bedroom and he, you know, his clothes were draped on it, <laughs> which is a common theme in sometimes when people get exercise equipment in their homes. But I want to point out one of the reasons why I think my father did so well, and he died in August of 2019 um, at the age of 89, after living for a, at least 45 years with heart disease. And I attribute that to a lot of the amazing advances in science leading to the medications that allowed him to live that long. Yeah. I feel like people don't realize that, I mean, once you get a heart disease diagnosis, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to pass away in the next year or two That's years. Right. You bring up a really good point, Calliope. My father had bypass surgery in 1986. These days, we do bypass surgery, but we also do procedures where we open up arteries with a balloon and put in a stent, which is a little coil to keep the artery open. And that's greatly shortened the time a person spends in the hospital. In fact, when people come in with heart attacks, they get whisked away to get the procedure to see if where the heart attack is coming from. That's known as a coronary angiogram and you can see the occluded artery because a heart attack is caused by one of the arteries of the, of the, of the coronary artery treat, so to speak. Those are the arteries that are on top of the heart feeding blood to the heart muscle so it can pump effectively. And by going in quickly and opening up the artery, you restore blood flow. In the past, when people had heart attacks, in the 1960s, that heart muscle was damaged forever. Yeah. Now we prevent that. And the most important thing is that when someone has a symptom, they think maybe a heart attack, they need to get to the emergency room quickly, not search the symptoms online, but call an ambulance so we can make the quick diagnosis, which we do with an electrocardiogram and a blood test, and then they can have the procedure restoring blood flow to their heart muscle. That's good advice to not wait if you think you have a symptom to just call 911 and go to the hospital right away because it could save your life. Most people associate a heart attack symptom of being crushing pressure in the center of the chest radiating to the arm, neck, and, or jaw. And of course, women can have that, but you may not have all of those symptoms yeah. at one time. And sometimes I have people who get the symptoms in the neck or down the arm and ignore them because they're not on the left side of the chest. But the heart symptoms don't have to be localized to the left side of the chest. It's anything above the belly button is fair game for a heart attack, if you think about that. Um, also, women can explain unbearable shortness of breath that comes on suddenly without doing any activity. Um, sometimes the tightness or pressure is lower down in the abdomen. So many women I see have initially thought it was a, a stomach problem and took antacids. And then others have had the same so, sort of pressure, but in their upper back. Particularly if you know you have risk factors, if you have a family history of heart attack, somebody's told you your blood pressure is high or cholesterol is high or you're diabetic, you shouldn't wait. You need to go to the hospital. Yeah. Oh, that's very good advice. 
Thank you. Growing up or even now, did you or do you have a mentor in STEM? And if so, would you recommend young girls to pursue mentors and to find mentors in STEM? Mentors, mentors come within your chosen field of work or practice, as well as outside. So clearly when I was starting out, I had a mentor and he, um, he was Dr. He is Dr. Richard Stein and he was my mentor early on and um, really encouraged, you know, a mentor is there to, you know, stimulate your ideas, help guide you in the direction, but not do your work. So it's really important to understand what a mentor is to inspire you. Yeah. And that's what he did. And I had so many opportunities earlier in my career. In fact, I think I've had amazing opportunities throughout my career. Um, and, you know, later on when I was a resident, I met Dr. Judith Hockman, who actually is one of my colleagues in cardiology at NYU. And um, she was a great mentor and has been a mentor to so many women who are cardiologists. And she is a researcher and she's focused her career on clinical trials research. And I think that's a very important area where we test out um, treatment regimens, new drugs, devices, and all kinds of things. And recently, she has been lead investigator in one of the largest trials funded by the National Institute of Health called the ischemia trial, which looks at whether or not people who have chronically clogged arteries should be treated with procedures like the stents I described earlier or given medication alone without a procedure. And they had really in, important findings that we consider in clinical practice now because the outcomes were the same. The, the people who got the procedure or the me medication who had chronic disease, long-standing heart disease, they lived as long, whether you had a procedure or took medicine. But they found that the people who had the procedures had less symptoms. So that brings an important point is that Yes, that's great. You can live as long, but if your symptoms are impairing your quality of life, maybe you should be someone who should have a procedure. So it's really dialed down on how we think about people who have chronically clogged arteries. So that she's made important contributions to science as well as mentoring a lot of us. And also I will point out that we have studies that have been ongoing in the cardiology community that have been stimulated by the Women in Cardiology Committee of the American College of Cardiology, which is my profession, one of my professional organizations that um, it gives educational programs and on online educational programs um, and has uh, scientific meetings and it's focused on the physicians. The American Heart Association, another professional organization that I belong to, funds research in cardiovascular disease. Okay, wow.